Hello, everybody. Roger says, hey. So I hear there's this little thing called the Euros happening right now over in Europe. I hear it's a football tournament basically just for European teams. Now recently I've made the decision to learn about football or soccer as Americans call it. It's not really a sport I'm familiar with because I didn't grow up playing it, I didn't grow up watching it. And even though the sport is gaining traction over here in the States, it's still a much bigger deal in other parts of the world. So my plan is to live stream the England versus Scotland match on Friday, but before I watch an actual game or match as you guys call it, I want to know the rules of the game and how it all works because there's not a whole lot of point in me watching something that I don't understand what's going on. So today I'm going to be watching a short video that hopefully explains some of this stuff to me so that I can go into Friday and get a little bit more out of the experience. And of course, stay tuned for the announcement for that live stream. I hope you guys will join me there and it'll be great. I won't be able to actually stream the match because a copyright but I'll probably have up like ESPN scoreboard. I'll have the match on that I'll be watching and I'm sure you guys will have it on as well and we can kind of chat about what's going on. And I'm sure I'll have a ton of questions that you guys can answer in real time for me. I also don't really have a favorite team or anything like that. I don't even know what most of the teams are so I guess that will be something that I choose at a later date. I don't know. So let's go ahead and get in this video and uh, find out just how little <laughs> I know about this sport. I hate watching soccer. They have to bring the stretcher out at least. So I've been times wanting to start game. following soccer for a while now, but as an American, I always found it complicated. Not like how they play. Most three-year-olds can kind of understand more or less how it works. I just mean how everything kind of works in Europe. You know, I would follow the World Cup, and I grew for the United States if they made it, and then I grew for Iceland because clearly they've all been practicing that clapping, and they're really good at it. But that only happens once every four years. So I turn on my TV. And it would be a, like a random game, like Parma versus Bologna. And first, I'd make sure that I wasn't watching the Food Network. But then I had no frame of reference for this game. Like, are these teams good? You know, is this a big game? Yeah, like, that. that's the thing. Is like, whenever I've, like, been flipping through sports channels and I would see soccer on and it would be random teams from some other part of the world and it's always these, like, obscure teams. I have no idea who they are, where they're from. If they're any good, like what he's he's talking about, and so there's no real incentive for me to to watch it because I just I don't have any frame of reference for that. Which one of these guys is Pele? You know, I I didn't know, and I had all these other questions. Like, you know, why why are teams getting kicked out of leagues? Why are they all rolling around on the ground so much? How are guys getting traded to different countries? And why why does everybody in the stands have a scarf? So a few months ago, I tried to start figuring it all out and I started watching some matches. That's the first thing. They aren't soccer games. They are football matches. And I bought FIFA you know for the Xbox, and I bought a scarf and a Vuvuzela because that's like the rules or something. So anyway, Sorry. this is all the info that I wish I'd known a year ago. This is my crash course of translating soccer into American. I'm going okay. to assume that you kind of know the rules. The biggest difference between American sports is how offsides works and the clock. Lots of people get upset about the clock. It goes up instead of down. Get over yourself. It doesn't really matter. Americans also get mad because the clock doesn't stop and games pretty much end whenever the ref feels like it. And you actually adjust to this pretty quickly. The game's an hour and a half long. You'll have your chances to score. And if you can't score, then it's not the clock's fault. I honestly don't mind that because I feel like the clock stops way, way, way too much in American sports and the games, like football games, American football games now go on four hours, at least college games do. I don't really watch the NFL. I, I like college sports primarily, um, but those games can or have started to get into the four hour range, which is ridiculous. Like. By hour three, you're kind of just waiting for the game to end, <laughs> you know? Basketball is a little more regulated. Those usually hit about the two hour mark. They rarely kind of go over that. But yeah, I, I can appreciate that then, that the clock doesn't stop so much. Some people, and, and when I say people, I'm referring both to discussions I've had with other Americans as well as like myself six years ago. So people think soccer is too slow. And when Americans look at a soccer field, 
something in our minds, we think that it's like playing hockey or playing basketball just on a big grass field. And in those sports, guys like go full tilt a lot, most of the game. So when two players are just standing there passing the ball back and forth, we wonder, why aren't they trying to move forward? Just go. Yep. And on the other side, we expect the defenders to be attacking the guy with the ball rather than just standing Uh five feet back and letting him do what he's doing. This is The key difference (laughs) is that soccer fields are much, sorry, football pitches are much larger than basketball courts and hockey rinks. And if you try to full court press for the whole soccer game, you would be exhausted wow. and you would probably work. Now, I'm a, bas- a basketball player. That was my primary sport. So I'm very, very familiar with how big a basketball court is. And that is tiny. <laughs> oh, my gosh. This is one reason why I didn't want to play soccer. It's just it's too much running. Like, I know there's a lot of running in basketball, but it's a lot smaller court, obviously. And when you go down, you run to one end of the court, there's not a ton of running around. It's mostly just kind of standing and then moving into different spots. You know, you're not just constantly running. And I just feel like with soccer, it's just, it's too large of an area, too much running. I hate running. So I just never really got into the sport. But man, that is a gigantic difference. If you had a full court press for the whole soccer game, you would be exhausted and you would probably lose. See, the the pace of a soccer game is actually much closer to baseball. Most of the game is going to consist of guys just slowly passing the ball around, real peaceful, and then it's going to be all of a sudden followed by the short bursts of extremely fast action. Basketball players, it's estimated, run an average of two and a half miles during a game. Soccer players can run seven, if not ten miles during one game. That's what I was just explaining. Basketball is, it looks like a lot of running, but in comparison, it's not. And remember, you only have three subs games, but most of these players will be playing the whole game. One thing Americans oh, really? will appreciate is that other than halftime... You only get three subs a game, so you can only substitute three times for like all of the players, or you can only substitute for a particular player three times. I'm not really sure I understand that. If you only get three subs a game, though, that is insane. Because in our sports over here, you're constantly subbing in and out. Like, there's there's no limit to it. One thing Americans will appreciate is that other than halftime, there are no commercials. So it's like the anti-NFL, which is great. Ooh, it also means that good. no matter where the ball <laughs> is, both teams are always potentially about 30 seconds away from scoring, which creates this kind of constant tension. It also creates a scenario where you can't ever really run to the bathroom or get a drink. Soccer players Mm. seem to have a reputation for being lazy in the U.S. because they don't always pop right back up after going to ground and get right back into play. Certainly some players do embellish things and some go over the top, but I don't really think that on the whole it's quite the issue that people make it out to be. They get made fun of in Europe too. Why are we just looking at a blank gray screen? I feel like you could put like pictures or something in here to make it a little bit more interesting. I apologize if this is boring for you guys. I am learning from this, you know, even though it might be boring for you. I am picking up some new stuff here. So here's a fun experiment to try the next time you have a few minutes. Go to like a local field and then quickly jog laps around that field for like 10 minutes. And then suddenly no. sprint down the mm-hmm. middle of the field as fast as you can. And when you're halfway up the field, while you're still sprinting, have one of your friends just shove you over onto the ground. And if you can pop right back up and keep sprinting, then you can keep complaining about those guys. A lot of the time, they're just taking a little rest. And everyone will either just keep playing around them, or both teams will be a little tired, so who cares? It's not a Matthew Riley (laughs) novel out there. The other reason for guys slowly passing the ball around is that one of the strategies currently employed by most teams is to just to maintain possession as much as possible. Obviously, this is no different in American football or why Russia is really good at hockey. The other team can't score when you have the ball. So teams will just pass the ball back and forth and even pass it back to their own goalie because it's better to go backwards with the ball than to maybe make a risky pass and let the other team have the ball. On occasion, you'll see a team make like 50 passes without the other team touching the ball, which can take a really long time, but then they'll go down and they'll score, and that's like as good as it gets. It's all about waiting for the precise moment for things to align and then all going together at the right moment. In terms of like positioning and formations, you'll usually have three or four numbers, like 4-4-2 or 4-3-3 or 4-2-3-1. 
Okay, I understand this because in basketball you also have uh, defenses that are like this, like a three-two or a two-one-two. Two, you know, so I I understand. I understand this. These numbers will always add up to ten, and then the goalie is just assumed. Different positions include the center backs, who will just stay as defenders, and then the full backs are both the left and the right back, who will defend, but then they'll also usually join the attack as well. And then we have midfielders, like a center midfielder, who can go both ways. Um, a center attacking midfielder or a center defending midfielder. And then up front, we have like a left wing and a right wing, sometimes a center forward and a striker up front who will, it's his job to just score goals. Yeah, the last video I said that there was a position called a guard and that that was wrong. Um, I think I was thinking about the forward and not the guard. Sorry, I was thinking in basketball terms because I knew that there was a a same position as like a, a basketball position and guard is what popped into my head but it's a forward is what i was thinking about also why was he saying that the midfielders can go either way um i thought that the players could go any direction so are they not allowed to in certain points of the game or and also you guys are calling it the attack the what we would call the offense you guys say the attack so that's that's different as well Fullbacks, you guys, um, I think we took some of these terms for these positions and put it into American football because there is a position called fullback, for instance, in American football. I don't know, we probably took the forward term from this too and put it into basketball. So One thing I'll mention that makes it easy to kind of get into soccer is that you can watch, legally watch, some old matches on YouTube. Um, this is unlike American sports. Like, why isn't there a website that I can go to to watch any game, like an iTunes for sports? So like I can pay two dollars to watch any game in history. Like all these games are on tape somewhere; they exist. Huh. But I can't watch a game in the 1986 World Series unless an international pandemic shuts down the world and there's no sports. And they just happen to put it on NBC or something. Like, come on. So anyway, um, so keeping the ball and attacking is referred to as positive football. You're always trying to move forward. This is what most teams do. This is what people like to watch a little more. It's kind of exciting. It's more exciting to watch that way. But of course, there's always a yin to the yang. So the yin is this guy named Jose Mourinho. And he basically says, I don't want the ball. I'm going to stand back with my players in front of my goal, and you're not going to score. And then every once in a while, when you're falling asleep and all your players are up in my zone, we're going to steal the ball and we're going to run down and score, which sounds a little bit risky except that it actually does work if you do it well. Jose's considered one of the best managers there is, and he has the trophies to back it up. He's won. Is his name Jose or Jose? That seems weird. I've never heard anybody pronounce it Jose before. Maybe it's a different pronunciation that I'm not familiar with. Jose's considered one of the best managers there is, and he has the trophies to back it up. He's won plenty of big tournaments with teams. Then I'm told if you tried to have that team keep the ball the whole time, like most coaches would, they would have been destroyed. They were too old, and they just would have got worn out and wiped out. But but by playing this negative defensive strategy, they were able to win. And despite this, teams that employ the strategy seem to get a bad rap for playing negative as opposed to positive football because keeping the ball seems to be the end thing right now. So obviously there's more thought that goes into, into it than I've described here. Like Diego Simeone and Atletico Madrid has been using this negative strategy for years, and they've been successful with it. On the flip side, the guys who've risen to the top playing possession football are also widely sought after. Two of the most well-known coaches right now are Jurgen Klopp and Pep Guardiola. And I highly recommend watching the series All or Nothing about Manchester City on Amazon Prime. It's about Guardiola's team a few years ago. And it's, it's quite clear from interviews with these guys that they're you know, quite thoughtful and well-traveled. I couldn't name a single baseball manager who can speak three languages. So speaking of Manchester City, they play in England. There are four main football countries in Europe. There's England, Spain, Germany, and Italy. England has the okay. Premier League, Spain has La Liga, Germany has the Bundesliga, and Italy has Serie A. So to take oh. one... Oh, okay. So you guys all have different leagues. Okay, so when I hear Premier League or Champions League, that's just England, basically, or the UK. I'm not sure what, all's, what all the countries are included in that. So... Each, each of these main like football countries have these different leagues, which makes sense, right? Because Spain would be playing in England's league, I guess. One country, they're all the same, but 
to take one country, England, the, the Premier League consists of 20 teams. Every team plays every other team, once at home and once away. And these leagues don't have playoffs. You get three points for a win, one for a tie. The team with the most points at the end of the season wins. And this All can right. and has come down to the final day of the season before. In the U.S., our leagues pretty much have the same teams every year. So if you suck, yeah. and even if you start to lose on purpose, the wait, U.S. so wait, what? And this can and has come down to the final day of the season before. In the U.S., our leagues pretty much have the same teams every year. So if you suck, and even if you start to lose on purpose, you actually get rewarded with the top draft pick the next year. If you finish in last place in one of these leagues, they literally kick you out of the league. But they call it oh. relegation because that's a nicer sounding word. Before we keep going, here's a quick aside on the MLS. Major League Soccer is the top league in the United States. It's different in many ways than the European leagues. There's no relegation, so the teams do stay the same from year to year, and there is a salary cap. Talent-wise, I guess globally speaking, it seems to be an okay league, but certainly not on par with any of the European leagues. So under the Premier League, which is at the top, under them is a league called the English Football League Championship. The three teams who finish at the bottom of the Premier League are relegated to the championship for the next season and replaced by three teams from the championship. The bottom three teams okay. in the championship are relegated to League One. The bottom three in League One are relegated to League Two, whose losers go to the National League, whose losers are... Uh, How many teams do you guys have? You have to have a lot of teams to fill up all of these different leagues. Like our professional sports over here... In pretty much all of them, you have two different divisions, and then, you know, all of the teams in that league are, well, I guess split into the two divisions. I'm not sure, like, how many, like, NBA or NFL teams there are, maybe, like, 30. So if there are, like, maybe 20 teams, in, I mean, how many teams do you guys have? Wow. No, nobody really cares about them except their moms at this part, but you get the idea. The Unless you really get into the soccer, you'll never hear about anything below the Premier League again but just so you're aware of what's happening down there. Okay. This system does a few things. First off, just because you're near the bottom of the standings, your games can still be extremely important. They still count because you're not trying to win the league anymore, but now you're trying to literally stay in the league. And the higher the mm -hmm. league you're in, the higher the check you get from TV contracts. So it's kind of a big deal. It also okay. creates this kind of theoretical meritocracy where you could start a team with a bunch of guys anywhere in the country, get into a kind of a tiny league, and then ultimately work your way up to the Premier League. In reality, that'd be like trying to take a single-A baseball team and work your way up to the majors, while the other better teams with bigger pocketbooks are trying to buy all your best players the whole way. But for the teams at the top, just winning the Premier League sounds pretty easy. You're, you're playing maybe one game a week. But that's the catch. There's other things going on here. So there's also the Carabao Cup, which is a tournament open to the top four leagues in England. And then there's the FA Cup, which has been going on since, like, forever, that it's literally open to every, like, team in England. So over 700 teams entered this one tournament last year. Like, imagine if... 700? Okay, I wasn't expecting that. I thought there might be a lot, but 700 teams? You guys have a tiny, <laughs> a tiny country comparative to the U.S., we don't have anything like 700 teams over here. We don't even have that many college, well, we might have that many college teams, but just not in the same league. So maybe maybe our college sports would be more analogous to what he's talking, talking about here because our professional sports, nowhere near 700. Not even with like the AAA teams in baseball do we come close to 700. That is insane. I mean, it just goes to show like how popular how popular the sport is and how much how loved it is over there because you guys have so many teams like that. Again, it's I think it's more analogous to our college sports over here, which I I know there's not really a direct comparison over in Europe to that, but I'm just I'm just hearing some things in here that make me think that way about it. Imagine if every major and minor league baseball team had one giant tournament. So could any team win? Yes, they could. Will the small teams upset the bigger teams? At some point, maybe a few will. But is it likely that a non-Premier League team is going to win? No, probably not. So more fun to think about in theory than practically, I guess. The final tournament is the, the big one. Like, what if we could find the best team in Europe? And I don't mean like each country gets a team. That's the European Championship that happens every four years. 
This I'm talking about the league clubs. So the best teams in, from all over Europe, from 55 different countries, battle it out each year. This is the UEFA Champions League. So as That's side what's note, going on now. these acronyms here. FIFA is the organization that runs like big international tournaments, like the World Cup, and they help to coordinate okay. things across different regions. If you're an American, you probably heard of FIFA because somebody on SportsCenter mentioned somebody that was involved with some kind of corruption investigation or something. <laughs> anyway, within FIFA, the world is divided into six different regions. UEFA is Europe. That's where like the best players go. CONCACAF, yeah. you may have heard of because that's what the U.S. is in, the Confederation of North Central America. Never heard of that before. <laughs> and in Caribbean Association Football, which is short and sweet. And then there's like the rest of the world. And each one of these okay. groups has tournaments with national teams and their league clubs, like the CONCACAF, Champions League. Look how small the OFC is. What the heck? Why are they so small? And Morocco is not included in any of this. So does Morocco not have... Do they not play this sport or something? Or are they banned for some reason? I don't know. With national teams and their league clubs, like the CONCACAF, Champions League, and the UEFA Champions League. And these are called like the Champions League, but really it's just a tournament. So the UA Okay, also on here, why is um why are these three countries, uh I forgot what they were called in South America. Um why are they part of the CONCACAF and not the CONMEBOL? That's a little weird. UA Champions League. And these are called like the Champions League, but really it's just a tournament. So the UEFA Champions League is played in conjunction with the UEFA Europa League, which is kind of like the NCAA and NIT basketball tournaments, but with a bit of a twist. They play the qualifying okay. rounds for the Champions League first. So if you get knocked out of the big boy tournament, but you finish high enough, you can just move down into the Europa League and try to win that. And I won't get into okay. the qualifying, but typically you're going to have teams that you may have heard of as, a, as an American like Manchester City, Liverpool, Manchester United, Tottenham Hotspur. From Spain, it'd probably be Barcelona and Atletico Madrid and Real Madrid. Serie A from Italy will have Juventus and Inter and Roma and Atalanta. Germany is pretty much dominated by Borussia. I have never heard of any of these teams from Italy or Germany. I've heard of a couple of them from... I've heard of Barcelona and Real Madrid, and I had heard of Manchester United and Tottenham Hotspur... I know Liverpool has a team. Manchester City, I don't think I was familiar with that until I watched my video on Chelsea. They they were mentioned they were they play Chelsea um in that and I made the stupid remark are Manchester City and Manchester United the same thing. I didn't know if uh, they were just referring to Manchester by a different name or if they were two different two different teams. And I apologize if I offended anybody by asking that question. And by the way, I don't really have an allegiance to any teams obviously because I just don't know enough about it over here. So if I make a remark about a team, it's just out of ignorance really. So don't take anything personally. Borussia Dortmund and Bayern Munich and then there's other popular teams like Paris Saint-Germain from France and Lyon from France and Ajax from the Netherlands. And then you throw Never in a few Russian these. teams and you're ready to party. So back to the Premier League. You remember how your team's playing that kind of standard 38-game schedule. So now also at the same okay. time you're competing in the Premier League, the Carabao Cup, the FA Cup, and the Champions League. And there's like a bunch of other small one-off games happening too. So even if you have the best team, you're still probably not going to win all these tournaments just because of the wear and tear. If you can win three trophies in a year, that's like special. That's called a treble. If you win four, that's called a quadruple, but that's pretty rare. And so the biggest payday is for winning your league, although I, for some reason, find the Champions League is hard to beat for excitement. So even though you can, soccer teams tend to trade players less than they do in the U.S. Rather, teams will just buy players from their current club so a contract is going to include your salary obviously but also something called a release clause which is a fee that would go to the current club for that player so while any team could negotiate a transfer fee with a player's current club a release clause takes that current team just out of negotiations altogether so a baseball player unhappy with the situation he could demand a trade and they might trade him and he'd be happy but if they refuse to trade him then he's kind of stuck. 
whereas the soccer player could just find another team willing to pay that release clause. And once a team agrees to pay the clause, then they can just negotiate directly with that player. Obviously, the better player, the higher okay. the fee is going to be, so the current club can go out and find a reasonable replacement. Another big difference is that while most sports in the U.S. have a trade deadline, and that's followed by a few weeks afterward where players cannot move to another team, soccer is kind of the opposite. So most of the time, you cannot move to another team. There are two periods a year called transfer windows that you can move during, so usually before and then halfway through the season. And you can sign a new contract for another team whenever, but you can't actually start playing for them until that next transfer window. And the last thing in terms of contracts is that in the U.S., most leagues have a draft, but soccer is pretty much like the Wild West. So teams will sign players, or I should say kids, like into their youth academy very young, like 10, 8 years old. And smaller teams who find a really good player really? could also include something called a sell-on clause when selling a player to a larger team that says, if the team buying that player turns around and sells the player again to an even bigger club, then that original team will get a percentage of that secondary sale. Okay, hang on. Um, they're signing 8- and 10-year-olds. I feel like I've heard something about that before where there's, there's like, a, like a really, really talented kid and the teams will want to kind of grab grab him while they can or something like that. I didn't know it was that young, though. I thought maybe they were teenagers at, at the point where they would sign them. They're signing eight-year-olds. Is that real? All right, so if you're still here at this point, you probably want more. So what's next? There are like an unlimited number of top goal or best goal compilations on YouTube, which are kind of interesting in the sense that you can actually show you know, new people to soccer the potential that the game has lots of americans exposure to soccer is like the women's world cup and obviously we have a great team there but you never really get to see that what different strategies look like like look up barcelona tiki taka videos you won't regret that they make grown men look like children okay. as i mentioned the all or nothing series on man city is great if you have amazon prime and obviously just watching games is good fifa tv has a youtube channel that has lots of international matches, or just look on YouTube for full football matches. If you're smart, you'll find them. Um, UEFA TV has old Champions League matches. I think you might have to register, but it's free. You'll probably want to follow BR's football channel on YouTube. They have a lot of good stuff, including this very funny series called The Champions, which I'd probably wait a little bit until you learn a little more about the uh, top players before watching that. One place I always turn to when trying to learn a new sport is video games. So FIFA would probably help, um, although the big caveat there is that it has horrible reviews. That said, is if you're just trying to learn the okay. rules, like basic tactics and which players are on which teams and who plays where, I would say it's been pretty helpful for me. Most of the next... I don't have any way to play video games right now. I don't have a gaming console. I have a Mac, which apparently is not really good for games. So FIFA's out. Maybe I can look at some of this other stuff. Negativity though. toward the game is the for the online, the FIFA Ultimate Team mode, where you end up paying for players for your team. But if you just avoid that and then like stick to playing against the AI, then you should be okay. The only thing I hesitate to do is play as Barcelona because you could control Leo Messi, and like who am I to tell God what to do? So I, I usually avoid that part. The alternative here it would be a game called Pez, which I've heard good things about, although it doesn't have licensing for many of the teams so jerseys will look different and team names will be slightly off which i guess might be confusing to someone new and i think fifa's player faces are a bit more recognizable too news wise there's coverage like everywhere of soccer although i do enjoy the site onefootball.com which brings us to the sponsor of today's video which is there's no sponsor for today's video um i just make these videos to push the boundaries of powerpoint and see how mad i can make myself Anyway, hopefully that helps somewhat. All right, well, you know what? I am not super impressed with that video. I, it's It was different than what I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be more of like explaining the rules of the game and kind of explaining maybe a little bit more in depth how the um, structure of European football works. But this did give me some really good information and I like some of the analogies that he made to American sports, which is helpful for me to kind of understand some of what he was talking about. So it's it's not like I didn't get anything out of this video. I did, although, you know, it was kind of like a little boring looking at just a blank, a blank 
slide for, you know, a good 30 seconds or whatever. I feel like he could have put in some pictures or something to represent what he was talking about, maybe. So I, again, apologize if any of you found this video boring, especially if you're already familiar with European football. A lot of this stuff is probably, like, super, super elementary to you. But a lot, like, I really enjoy the way he explained the different leagues and especially with, like, the world map and kind of showing the breakdown of the different leagues and how the, the teams are kind of grouped together. That was helpful for me. It was also helpful for me to know about the UEFA. He pronounced it a certain way and I don't remember how he said it, but um, I've seen you guys online refer to it as the Euros, so I'm just gonna say the Euros. It was kind of helpful for me to kind of know have some context basically for that going into this game on Friday for me. I am going to have to find a video that explains the rules because at the very beginning he said I'm going to assume that you know the rules of soccer. I, I don't. I don't know the rules at all. I don't know how the game is played other than uh, you pass the ball and you try to score. And um, I did pick up, you know, I know that there are penalty kicks. Somebody said that, that like the yellow cards mean a foul, red cards mean the, the players kicked out of the game. I learned what the, the corner corner throw, something like that was. But other than that, I really, really don't know how the game is played. So I'm going to have to find another video on here and hopefully try to watch that before Friday. Maybe I'll post that one tomorrow um, or I'll post it on Friday before I do my uh, live stream. Appreciate you guys watching. If you can answer any of my questions below in the comments, I would appreciate it. I do read the comments. Also make sure you like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. I also have some social media and my Discord link in the description of this video and in my pinned comment, so check those out if you're interested in that. And stay tuned for more... Uh, I always want to say soccer, I apologize. Um, I'm just used to calling it soccer. But stay tuned for more football stuff coming up in the future. I really do want to learn more about this game, learn about the teams, kind of like just learn the culture over in Europe because it's such a huge part of the world culture outside of the United States. It's really not part of our culture at all, so it's something different for me to learn about. Anyway, Roger here and I thank you for watching and we will see you next time.